playing a video game, right? Like yep. why, why, why has it got to be harder? So that's where we started from the front end and then the back end with our engineering and, and just solving problems. So yeah, we try to make it easy. We try to have some fun, but uh, love to chat about it today. Okay. Well then it looks like we're getting a bit of a quorum and I know we're going to have a lot of content to cover today. So why don't we just go ahead and get cu- uh, kicked off today, uh, Kevin? Let's start with a quick introduction about yourself, um, an introduction about Oasis Works. I know you have some things you wanted to share with us, and then we'll go into some Q and A. Is that okay? As a way to start? That sounds great. Sure. Awesome. Go for it, my friend. All right. So Kevin Kramer, thank you all for having me here. I see a lot of very familiar names and faces. So we uh, we have crossed paths in the in the past. Glad to be on the call today with Jim and and all the stuff that's going on with the 5G Open Innovation Lab. So uh, I started my journey a long time ago writing software and then eventually doing uh, architecture and design at the system level for soft switches and, and voice gateways and then eventually moved into sales marketing and, and business development. And then went through a lot of different startups and acquisitions. Uh, a lot of the founding team here were, was at Starrent Networks. So a lot of us met at Starrent and then ended up at Cisco together, did some other startups together. But three and a half years ago, a few of us got together and said, hey, let's try to start our own company. Let, let's do this. Let's see what happens. We've all worked for big companies and we've all worked for small companies. And Let's, let's try to do it ourselves. Let's try to own the culture, the DNA. Let's solve the problems that we think are interesting to our customers. And so Oasis Works is three and a half years old. And we started with the premise that it should be as easy as playing a video game to put software on hardware reliably, predictably at scale. And we don't really care what the hardware endpoint is. And we don't actually require a hardware endpoint. And I'll show you here in a little bit that, you know, deploying software as a software endpoint alone is also important and necessary so that you can get like Azure IoT up and running and connected and and doing its real goodness on top of an edge infrastructure. So the organization is 15 people and we're based just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And we should be closer to 20 or 25 next year. We haven't raised a single round of funding. We've been doing this all ourselves with customer engagements and our biggest customer right now uses our software to deploy and manage uh, satellite gateways that sit on planes, trains, automobiles, et cetera. And so that's our biggest customer, but now we have some other customers that are coming online in, in late 2020 and early 21. And really it's about making the edge easy to consume and easy to operate. And that's what we've been working on. And, and uh, by the end of next year, we will have a lot of IoT endpoints onboarded and we're able to do a lot more sensor monitoring and gateways and you know multi-industry multi-vendor doesn't have to be tightly integrated and it's as simple as uh, either using an adapter or and modifying a json schema and that was a, a real big part of our scale so our satellite customers got scale for 250,000 hardware endpoints and we're doing over 3 million stats events and alarms per second so running at incredibly high scale across a lot of Docker containers with Kubernetes, et cetera. And we can jump into a little bit of the architecture and why we chose to do it this way. And then in the front end is a video game engine that we call Stratum. And I'll show you guys some of that. So that's who we are, Jim. Awesome. And this start off, I know Satellite is one of your biggest customers today, but you also um, had seen similar needs in other industries. Oil and gas is one that we had talked about over a year ago and others. And so as we get through some of the, the demonstration of the product and, and other content you want to share, I'd love to actually dig into how you're seeing commonalities of the problem you're solving in one large customer, but how that's now bleeding into all these other industries. Because guess what? That problem exists everywhere, right? What you guys are working on. So why don't we take a look at the product if, you, if you're open to doing a quick demonstration of it? Of course. Uh, let me show you a quick video because the video casts the vision of easy. And then I'll show you the product itself and how you actually realize the, uh, the vision. So I'm going to share my desktop because that's the easiest way for me to bounce back and forth between these. Can you guys see my screen? We can. All right, here we go.
wow, it's come, <laughs> it's come a long way. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a crazy journey. You talk about the oil and gas folks. Um, yeah. The the crazy thing about oil and gas was, sorry, that's the home phone. I got to disconnect it. No worries. Um, the uh, oil and gas taught us something really interesting, which was, you know, when you s- when you scale to hundreds of thousands or millions of endpoints or devices, the IT organization scratch their head and they're like, dude, I'm not managing that. I manage data centers like I manage hundreds of things, maybe thousands, but hundreds of thousands. Are you kidding me? I got to push a Linux operating update to 150,000 IoT gateways. I'm not doing that. And so it, it was really interesting for us because then we said, well, if, if the IT team's not going to do it and the OT team has to do it and they don't know what CICD, CICD is and, and Python mm-hmm. is a snake, it's not a scripting language. And, you know, they just, they decided that uh, this was going to be an OT problem. And we, we agreed that if it was going to be an OT problem, that it should be solved from the easy perspective, which means allow somebody to compose from atomic artifacts, ISO images and images that have to be deployed, and then, you know, click a set of sites or click a uh, set of endpoints and deploy that software and then configure it and monitor it all from the same tool set. But you had to have role-based access and all that kind of stuff in order to make sure it worked and the right people could work on certain things. So we have learned a lot, but to your point, Jim, whether it's a Starbucks coffee shop or whether it's an oil and gas customer, whether it's a 5G edge or a satellite customer, the reality is they all have hardware, right? Hardware gets deployed. Hardware has got to have software put on it and then it's got to be configured and then it's got to be managed and monitored. And so when you break it down to the most base level, it's got network computed storage and and you need to be able to install, configure and, and manage and monitor network compute and storage. And they come in all kinds of sizes and shapes. But that is where we have seen uh, a very common problem statement, whether it's at the edge, far edge, near edge, uh, whether it's at an oil rig that is connected sometimes and disconnected other times. So you have to work in a broken arrow mode. Um, it's the problem is the same, right? At Starbucks, uh, every coffee shop looks like a little data center. It looks like an edge location, right? It's got yep. hardware. It needs software. It needs to be managed and, and configured. And you need to be able to do that from a central location at scale. And so that's the common problem statement we see across all these industries and we believe that if you can do it easily and you can re-image it and recompose it or even let your customers re-image it and recompose it, they're just going to eat it up because the application providers need access to those resources, but they need it configured in a certain way. I need a GPU over here. I need an FPGA over there. I need some data acceleration here. I need Kubernetes over there. I need OpenStack or something else over there. But the, the application providers don't want to have to mess with all that IaaS and PaaS. They just want to know that it's set up, get it set up, drop their applications, start using the applications in the infrastructure, and then manage and monitor it. And it's the same thing for the edge service providers. It shouldn't be a project, shouldn't be a bag of, of parts. You know, I always joke that, you know, customers want margaritas right now, and we're making margaritas. They don't want a, a bag full of blender parts. And, you know, if you pay my SI or you shake the blender parts or the open source, if you shake it up enough, maybe a blender will pop out in 50 years. Well, they want a blender right now. So we're selling blenders and uh, we're not selling bags of parts. And but that's taken us three years to put the blender together, if you will. will. And And the blender is so different, right? Because in an old sysadmin's perspective, they were writing PowerShell scripts or or using a, you know, green screen to deploy a lot of this. And you guys built all of this on top of a gaming engine, right? Well, we built it on top of a lot of back end microservices and we put a gaming engine in front of it um, so that you could interact with it. Now, if you're not a big UI person, we have a common API that you can interact with. But when we started seeing all of our customers and and we've been doing this journey for three and a half years now, we heard some very common sentiment, which is, you know, my labor pool is tight and our staff is not software savvy and we cannot train them effectively, right? So it's gotta be easy. Anybody can play a video game. So at Mobile World Congress in 2019, Antonio Neri, the CEO of HP, was using our software to drag and, soft, drag and drop software. And he's like, it has to be this easy. If the CEO can log in and drag and drop software to edge sites, 
then pretty much anybody can do it. Um, they also said that, you know, we got to evolve from closed silo vendor specific solutions and leverage open source, you know, hardware and software, but we need a product. We don't need a project. Um, and, and then just a few other things that, you know, really hit us from a scale perspective, which, you know, like I mentioned with the, the oil and gas is our IT department has told us they're not going to manage thousands of devices, let alone millions. So you, you've got to give somebody the tools to do this and it's got to be easy. And, and that's what we've been working on. But it turns out easy is really hard um, to make something easy is incredibly hard. Our, our UI team is uh, incredibly sophisticated and, and very, very bright. But, you know, when you look at our P&L, the, the operations cost of having a UI team is very high, but we believe in it and it comes across hopefully in our UI and our experience. Um, and, you know, as far as the edge goes, these are the other things that they've said that, you know, everything's going to be connected. We've got to make sure that we can get regulation and compliance, security and SLAs from it. Um, hardware and software is very different, regardless of the vendor, regardless of the application, whether it's a satellite gateway or an IoT gateway or a, a server from Dell or HP. And the, and the last piece is that it has to run in a broken arrow mode, which means the edge could be transient. And, you know, we learned this really really well with our satellite provider is that a lot of the satellite stuff comes and goes based on weather and, and lots of other characteristics. But if your edge sites need work and you can get to them and do work, great. But if you can't get to them, the edge sites still need to provide the value and the service. And so the broken arrow mode was something else we built in to the product from day one and have tested, you know, you know. extensively with our satellite provider. Hey, Kevin, before you go on, you, you, you have a point down here under why now that says 5G is coming and SDN is mature. Can you can you touch on that for a moment? Because it's related to some other things that we've talked to other folks about. But can you touch on how you guys are thinking about that at Oasis Works? I mean, we all understand that 5G is coming. We all understand that, you know, it is going to provide a completely different user experience. And that user experience could be you know, telemedicine, it could be getting rid of wires completely, or, you know, in a lot of cases, a great augment to the existing wired network or even Wi-Fi network. So the idea is that, you know, 5G is going to come, it's going to allow pretty much any device on the planet to access the wireless network, to access the core services in a cost effective way, and in a right sized way. So yeah. what that means is that, you know, in a cost effective and right size way, things that have never been connected will now be connected because they can and they should be and that it'll make sense and you can enforce SLAs and and you can do, you know, eSIM programming that says, hey, I'm over here at this time and over there at that time. But the other piece of it is that, you know, when it comes to moving information, you got to have pipes. Right. And and whether it's pipes in between east, west or north, south, you know, you've got to have the pipes. And so as devices and as the network is heaving and contracting based on usage, you need to have this SDN core in order to heave and contract as well. And right. it's, it's kind of in response to the edges heaving and contracting. And right. SDN is, is now mature enough to take that information and close that loop. So that you don't hey you don't say hey the edge is heaving, but the core oh you got to put a trouble ticket in and a work item and you got to wait two weeks for the core to heave right SDN can heave in response to the edge heaving or contracting and again it's bringing in this cost effective right size solution so the combination of those two things is going to make this a really really interesting opportunity but what it means is. You're going to have a lot of people doing a lot of things and maybe for hours, days, minutes, years, or maybe for just 15 seconds. Yep. And, and you'll see that coming with 5G and, and now that the core can heave and contract. But it just means the, the, the people and their services and the endpoints are, are fluid and transient. And you need something that can help you know, stay in touch with that in a near real time way. The other thing that um, we're seeing, and in, in, in some of this is materializing in Magma, uh, Project Magma from from Facebook. Boris Rensky is from FreedomFi in our current batch, and we were chatting about SDN the other day. But with with the maturing of SDN, not all data packets need to go to a cloud, right? They could stay local and they could be processed local, and that's a that's a big step forward. In fact, the 
the same engineers that built uh, Project Magma came from Niceria that was acquired by VMware not too long ago. So that that's actually game changing too. If you think about for an enterprise, you don't necessarily need to secure packets across large LANs or WANs. You could actually um, process a lot of that data locally, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. If I I'm now I'm logged into the Stratum UI that's sitting on top of our product, and yep. what we have over here on the right is our our external filters. But the notion here is that you're going to have millions or billions of devices on your on your screen. And if you have millions or billions of devices, it starts to look like some sort of psychological test, like a Rorschach inkblot test, and you have no idea what's really going on. <laughs> right. So we worked on this idea called binning, and the deeper you dive into the bins, the more resolution you get on the things that are going on in the bins. But to your point, right, with satellite and IoT and some of that locality of stuff, we have the ability to bring in geofencing concepts that say, hey, if you decide there is a geofence here for some reason, regulatory security, or even just traffic patterns, and you have set up a geofence, we can overlay that information onto the network. So people are like, hey, why isn't the information getting to where it is? And they'll see, oh, it's in a geofence, right? Um, this is our satellite overlays for our customers because they have to use their RF mapping and boundary stuff. Right, so here's regulatory geofencing, but this is uh, just another notion that says, hey, there's all this external data and information and constraints that we need to put into this tool. They're typically separate, maybe in an Excel spreadsheet or Visio diagram, but we can eat all of this external information, you know, in the terms of like clouds. Hey, the oil rigs out in the Gulf of Mexico are down. Why is that? Oh, look, you've got weather rolling through there, right? You need to be able to see these things. And, and this, if you're a consumer of an edge service and you're like, hey, why is my edge right now? And you can log in and say, oh, there's weather rolling through. OK, it'll be OK. I don't need to call the service provider or the edge provider. So this was just another piece of our integration that we thought, you know, there's a lot of information out there that people are going to want to see and have overlaid. And then they can start making some more interesting closed loop kind of work and, and use AI and ML to do some inferencing and, and some predictive remediation, et cetera. So yeah, we, we, we love all these concepts and we love ingesting this information. Our, our goal here is to integrate, unify, and visualize, not to replace. Good. So now that we're in this, thanks for that, um, Kevin. That's really helpful. Now that we're in your management UI, these are uh, bins, as you mentioned earlier, right? So if you drag into or deep dive into the bin even further, what, what is it that an operator is able to see here? So I logged in as the tenant admin and uh, the tenant admin is the admin that allows me to do whatever I want. We have sure. a full AAA RBAC, you know, it'll eat information out of LDAP or whatever the authorizing backend system is for the enterprise. But um, I had logged in as, as tenant admin and tenant admin allows me to see everything. It allows me to create tenants. It allows me to look at the tenants. But if I logged in as a particular executive, I could look at just dashboards or I could do global filters on, you know, customers that I really care about. Um, or I could run global searches that say, hey, uh, find me all the locations that have GPU acceleration. You know, that's a really important that's a really important aspect of workload placement from an application provider's perspective to say, hey, I don't need to deploy my application on infrastructure that doesn't suit me well. I need to employ my application on infrastructure that's perfect, but I know what's perfect and I need GPU acceleration. So from there, you can run the global queries like this is our global query and, uh, and search object list. But what happened there was I switched from the geo view into the logical view. And uh, inside the logical view is where we start assembling all of the backend services through our Stratum UI and through our common API. And you can see here, you've got this opportunity to go in here and create or edit or modify the dashboards that you care about or are creating and, and monitoring. You've got administrative tools for policy, security, notification, and tenant settings. Um, but from here, You've got operations and you can do workflows, change sets, 
change sets is something that uh, we have implemented in a way that allows you to run an impact analysis that says, hey, I need to go upgrade all this Linux operating systems because there's a patch. Uh, can you tell me what customers are going to be impacted or tell me what services are running out there so that I can decide, hey, should I run this you know, impact analysis? Should I go ahead and upgrade that or should I wait, let everybody know and then put it in the queue and stage it? So allowing you to go see what you're going to impact, do it, roll it back or pause it and, and just stage it. So that's what our change sets allow you to do. Workflows are uh, the ability to install Linux, install Kubernetes, bring up an entire VMware pod. And then we've got events, alarms and notifications. A lot of folks just eat alarms directly out of the endpoints and they're categorized as alarms, but we allow you to take alerts and take alerts and put them into a bucket that says, hey, I'm seeing a lot of this going on. Let's notify somebody. And if the notification continues and things get out of the uh, scope, then we can turn it into alarms. The reason we broke all this up into events, alarms, and notifications is the ability to give an AI or an auto remediation engine information that is pre event or pre failure to say, we're noticing a lot of these things happening. And the last time this happened, this was the consequence. So we can start tracking events all over the globe and say, it looks like this is going to happen because this is what happened last time. We can feed that into an AI or inferencing engine. They can do their goodness and then push back a response. So we didn't just take alarm aggregation and bubble it up. We broke it down into events, alarms, and notifications so that we could use it for completing the loop with AI and ML systems. Now, we don't do that. We have the information. We provide it to the inferencing system. They would then do all that goodness. And then through the API, they would push a change for us to react to it. So um, that's a lot of the stuff in the operations area. Uh, if we go back here and uh, I go to site groups, the what you're seeing is the UI reading a JSON model. So between our entire back end and our entire front end, the only thing we edit for a satellite customer versus an edge compute customer versus an IoT customer is a JSON data model. That's it. You edit the JSON data model and the whole front end and back end auto generates itself. We don't have UI people going in there and building satellite UIs and we don't have them building IoT UIs. It doesn't scale, too cost uh, prohibitive and, and takes way too much time. So uh, a customer or a partner can go in and edit the JSON model. And if you don't like that to be cell aggregation, you could call it Larry. If Larry's what you want to call it, you edit the JSON model and then Larry shows up in the UI. Um, and that auto generates all the back end databases and microservices, et cetera. And then the last thing we have is an adapter. How do we talk to that endpoint? Is it SSH? Is it REST? Is it CLI, SNMP? Our satellite customers use XDR. That was new to us. So we built an XDR adapter, but JSON model is at the brains of all of this and adapters are how we bring endpoints on. And that's it. That's how we can use this to manage retail coffee shops, oil and gas. That's how we can manage edge. Um, and like I said, it is multi-tenancy. You see this one labeled with a particular server vendor. This is one of our biggest partners. And this is a, a, a rebranded, relabeled version of our tool for them. And they can then sell this as a multi-tenancy so that uh, somebody like Best Buy could log into a uh, HP Edge and then do all their work and it would look like they're logging into an HP tool or a service provider tool. Now, would you would you mind showing us what it would what is a day in the life of provisioning new packages for endpoints and how, kind of how easy that looks too? Sure. So if I go back to global and let's say I'm going to go to the site groups um, Labs has a lot of sites already pre-populated, but you know, let's say I wanted to add a new lab site and we come in here and, and we call it the 5G Open Innovation Lab. And this is uh, 5G infrastructure and 
testing Stracutri. I'm hungry. Been up since four. <laughs> uh, and then you click continue. Oh, that's right. I forgot. This is the new version. I have to put it into a change set. So uh, the first thing I have to do is create a new change set. Uh, this is where the impact analysis is coming in. So adding 5G Open Innovation Lab. Um, New set site or set of sites for all right. So you see that's it. Now the 5G open innovation lab is added. Mm -hmm. It's also added to the change set, which means if I come up here and I don't want to look at the change set, then if I come back out you'll see the 5G Open Innovation Lab is gone. So what this has done is it's taken the 5G Open Innovation Lab and all the structure that's gonna go into that and put it in a change set. So mm -hmm. it's basically staged. So we can go and create an entire site. We can create all the infrastructure in the site and all it is is staged. And this is a part of our life cycles. So if I just pop into my life cycles really quickly, um, and show you guys how we break this thing up. The idea here is that people are going to need to onboard sites in the tool with a lot of information, but that could be far ahead of the VAR or the actual site being brought up or the racks being installed. And so you shouldn't have to wait for that. And we can ingest uh, from an Excel spreadsheet or through an API from some other database, we can ingest all the site details, put them into this change set that says, hey, these sites are coming, but don't screw around with them until they're live. And then once they are live, you can then push the change set and all that infrastructure comes up and it's now brought into the system. But it's not actually a part of the system until you, you apply the change set. So we have this notion of staging. And one of our customers has asked us to even eat a uh, bill of materials from their VAR. Like, let's say they're going to order 10,000 servers. It's going to go into 19 sites and 10 of those sites are new and nine are old. So we will create a change set. We will eat all of that information and then hold it. And then when somebody says, hey, the sites are up or a site is up, you can take and apply that change set and bring it online. But before then, it's just kind of sitting in a staged in a stage notion. And so that's what you're seeing here. So if I go back to the adding the 5G Open Innovation Lab and I click on my sites again, it'll read the database and there's my lab. So from here, I can now dive in and add racks. So I can come in here and add rack one, uh, Dell. It's kind of funny to type that in the tool branded this color, but <laughs> is what it, it'll make for a great YouTube video. I'm sure I'll get some calls. In, indeed, indeed. Uh, eval of AMD based servers. Create, and you click continue. And so now I've got a rack. So now I've got a rack and we've broken this into rack mount servers and enclosures, meaning is it a one RU, two RU kind of thing or does it have cartridges? Cause a lot of the server vendors have cartridges. And at each rack, there is a scale edge. And edge is where we do all of our networking configuration because a lot of the work that has to be done on servers and switches is done at a layer two, at a layer two domain. So we put a set of containers in the rack so that we can talk to all of this stuff. In order to image software, you've got to be able to log into their VSP ports or their IDRAC or ILO ports. You've got to be able to username and password in so you can go and image it. You can set the boot order and yada, yada, yada. So we have to have a scale edge container. It's just a soft container in the rack so that we can have access to this from a networking perspective, et cetera. The other thing it does is scale edges actually contain, if I jump back over here to my presentation, and show you what scale and stratum really are. This is the architecture of, of scale and stratum at a high level. Stratum's our UI, it's the repurposed video game that allows us to bring 3D and a lot of these overlays into the, into the product. Now, 
we've refactored the whole game engine because it eats all of its programming from a JSON model, which is not done anywhere in the industry right now. People go in and create uh, TypeScript code or HTML5 code or JavaScript, but our JSON model feeds information into our, our UI generator. And then the UI generator creates all that code. And then all that code is pushed into the, to the Stratum UI. But once the UI is generated from the data model and the backend is generated from the data model, we use a common API. It's a GraphQL API. There's not you know, 5,000 REST endpoints here that someone has to manage. So from our API, you can go in and you can ask a question of the tenancy service the logging service, uh, the messaging service, and possibly the licensing service all in one query. So it's a very complex query that says, hey, tell me what customers in what locations are using what server types and what their fan speeds are, You know, whatever it is. It's a common API that you can come into. And this is where that common API can be used to do that closed loop AI ML inferencing in order for us to send them information and then through this AI, they can send back very complex instructions for us to go ahead and auto remediate once the AI engine has done its uh, its goodness. And so hmm. scale comes in two forms, uh, scale edge and scale central. And what you saw at the top of rack in this is a scale edge. A scale edge is just a very small version of this scale infrastructure. And it's really so we can run in broken arrow mode and so we can do things at the layer two connectivity uh, domain. So we have a time series database there. We have a config database. We have a relationship database. We have a Kafka bus. Um, sometimes people feed us information directly onto the Kafka bus and then we go ahead and, and implement that from the Kafka bus. But the idea here is that there's a little bit of software running in a couple containers in a rack and that somebody can disconnect scale edge and the scale is still scale edge is still doing all of its goodness. The edge is still running and gathering information for SLAs, et cetera. And then if it comes back online, scale edge will connect back to scale central and scale central is just a giant horizontally distributed version of all of these services. And so that's what scale edge is at the rack. Yeah. So, so Kevin, in a, in a world where let's go back to oil and gas for a second, you know, the, that the IT team says, this is awesome. We want Oasis works, but you know, Kevin, don't make us go discover everything. We don't know what we have. You know, we can, we kind of know where our data centers are, but if there's a hundred thousand IOT devices, we don't, we don't know where those exist. So my understanding is that Oasis works does its own sort of discovery. Is that correct? We do discover things. I mean, we, we obviously start with some sort of inventory database, right? Because everybody has an inventory database and it may not be accurate or up to date, but we usually start with an inventory database and we eat that. We usually put it in a change set that says, hey, you know, this is network discovery change set one. Go eat the inventory database and put it in a change set so that they're not impacting all the other stuff they do on a day to day you know, operations perspective. So we'll eat the inventory database. And then what we'll do is from that perspective, Scale Edge is able to sit out there and go and ping away in various different ways, interfaces and see what comes back. And once we find something, we can bring that into the change set and then somebody can come in and say, oh yeah, that's an IoT gateway. And okay, I didn't know that was out there and live. It, you know, it doesn't look like it has any customers on it. So we always start from some ground of an inventory database. Yep. And then from there, we can discover things and present that to the user to say, uh, this looks like uh, an endpoint of this type, but you need to kind of confirm it because we don't have the intelligence to say uh, you know, exactly what it is, unless it comes in over the API or the REST interface where you know, it's got a MAC address or a serial number or some sort of um, defining feature that'll allow us to then categorize it, but then they still have to kind of go and affirm it. Right, makes sense. Well, you know, look, this is, uh, we're talking about for the most part, still a very centralized IT platform today, right? There is branch and, uh, and, and cloud and such, but as we get, as we all get deeper into where the edge is going, all of this is just gonna get multitudes more complex than what we know of today. That's why I was asking that question. It, 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 I think I think this is exciting. Cool, sorry to interrupt. That was, um, that was good insight. Yeah, no worries. And I've been talking 
for a little while here. Um, I'd love to hear some feedback or questions or stump the chump yeah. kind of situations <laughs> that you guys want to throw out there. I'm, I am well caffeinated at this point in the day. So let's, let's have some two-way dialogue. Sure. I think Sri Ram had a question. Sri Ram, did you want to go first? Sri Ram, you there? Hey guys, can you hear me? Yeah. You guys can you hear me? Sorry, I'm having connection issues. I apologize. That's why I turned my video off. But if you can hear me, um, great, Kevin. That was that was super interesting. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, my question was, um, how do you work with RAN providers? So private LTE, private 5G, um, SaaS integrated RAN. Uh, there's, of course, the IoT side of the world. Let's say that's anything from any IoT protocol or even LTE, MNB, IoT. But let us say, um, in addition to Wi-Fi infrastructure, those RAN infrastructure and, and other radios, how do you integrate with those? How do you, how does the network management suite integrate with you? Or does it at all? In the case of getting infrastructure ready, we we allow the the customer to basically pick your hardware, pick your operating system, you know, make some specific BIOS configurations, uh, you know, make some specific acceleration configurations, whether it's DPDK or GPU or FPGA or SmartNIC or whatever, and and then put down a Linux operating system. We call that kind of the primer coding. And once you've got that all done, if an application like VRAN or something can then use that primer coded IaaS and deploy their own PaaS and then you know, install and scale their, their application, that allows the operator to manage the IaaS level, possibly manage the PaaS level, and also it allows the application provider to say, hey, I need a particular stack of software and configurations. Uh, it allows them to do that through a blueprint and you can deploy the blueprint. You can then manage, monitor and I'm sorry, manage and monitor all the infrastructure there. But when it goes above the PaaS layer, other than like Azure IoT and, and basically getting Azure IoT brought down, configured, connected and wired in, um, the application layer and above, we're trying to make it incredibly easy for the application providers to deploy, and we don't get into the application uh, at this time. No, I, so my question was much more on the network stack itself, right? So uh, not in the application. So um, let's say I had an NMS, I had different EMSs, element management systems, uh, both for the 4G, 5G side and Wi-Fi side and IoT side. How do I, do those integrate into your framework at all? Or would the um, EMSs and the data coming from the EMSs be separate from your system? I didn't quite catch that, I'm sorry. No, we're trying to get away from the notion that you have to have a separate EMS and NMS per vendor, per market segment, per deployment, per edge, Wi-Fi, et cetera. So we can talk, yeah, we can talk directly to the controllers in a Wi-Fi network. We can talk directly to the mesh access points in the network. We can talk directly from our device managers to all of those things, and we can provide you this integrated fully lifecycle management experience. Now, we could also talk to the EMSs that the I EMSs see. talk to the endpoints. Um, and it doesn't matter to us hierarchically where we sit, but if you want to take and I manage a, a Wi-Fi deployment from uh, Aruba and from Meraki with one UI, we can do that. So instead of Aruba and Meraki, if I gave you a 5G mesh network with device managers, can you just integrate directly all the way up? Yes. Okay. Uh, let, let's please talk, because um, that's what sure. we do. We do a 5G mesh network. Uh, we are Aruba's answer for 5G. I mean, yeah, for for us, as, as long as it's a, as long as it's an endpoint, we can talk to it. the 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 real question is, what do you want to do to the endpoint, right? If it's just eat data, that's a a pretty simple, you know, that's like our operate lifecycle module, and the the JSON model is pretty simple. If you want to do really creative validation of configurations of deployments, then you know we have to get a little more creative in the JSON model. If all you don't want to do is push down IP addresses or 
you know, usernames and passwords configure. So um, as long as we can talk to the endpoint, and as long as we know what you want us to do to the endpoint, the JSON model tells us, you know, kind of what we need to do to the endpoint and the device manager, either we have it or we build it or you build it and give it to us, um, is, is uh, then everything auto ingests into the system. So the, the big aspects there are uh, identity management, uh, seamless roaming, public private, um, overall provisioning. Um, those are the big aspects uh, among among others. But I'm guessing much of that should be standard, right? Um, it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have, like I said, we have a time series database for all of your time sensitive information. And then we have a config and relational database. And that's where we, that's where we push and pull all that information for doing those operational uh, activities you just described. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Kevin, let's, let's switch gears for a moment. Um, thanks for walking us through Oasis Works. Let, let's put your founder hat on now. And there's uh, one or two questions that I had that I think you could provide some insights for all the teams on. You had mentioned that you and your your co-founders coming out of Starrent wanted to go create sort of the the easy button of of what Oasis Works has manifested in becoming today, and your revenue generating. But what were your early days in terms? Of how do you you know how you went out and validate the problem statement and and started initially scoping together the vision of what Oasis Works has become, landing your first customer. Any sort of like looking back, had I known I would have done differently moments, or got it, you know, we were we were really smart in in thinking about this opportunity in this way that helped us save time. But any sort of like founder to founder nuggets of insights that you have top of mind that you'd like to share? Yeah, I would say, you know, if we go back to the beginning of Oasis Works, um, you know, Tim Mortsoff is somebody who I've worked with at, at many different companies for a super long time. Um, he's one of the brightest, most giving people I've, I've ever met. And he is able to in, ingest a tremendous amount of complexity and then write a god awful amount of software. So one of our concepts in founding the company was our CEO should be really, really, really engrossed in the technology and what we're doing. We find that a lot of times leaders get out of touch with the technology and we never ever wanted that to be the case. Now, you could argue uh, a CEO shouldn't write software. You could argue that they should be a little bit higher and, and run the business. And you know, um, we do some job sharing in that way, but Tim is, is very, very technical and he's always rapidly prototyping and he's always solving problems. And he sits right next to the developers and, and says, hey, I just checked my code in and uh, can you guys go test it and make sure it works? And then you know he spins his chair around and he says, okay, Kevin, where's the money coming from today? Um, so that was one of the big things. We wanted the, the leadership to be very, very, very technical and hands-on. I'm, I'm one of two people in the company that don't write software. Used to write software a long time ago, but don't write software anymore. And Scott Miley was the other co-founder. Um, Scott and I have known each other for 21 years. We've done a lot of life together. So the point I'm making here is, you know, when we all got together, this is a, a group of people that have known each other for a very long time. And we've known what we're, we're good at and where our blind spots are. And so we fill in for each other. Like right now, um, you know, I'm doing HR, finance, legal, uh, you know, sales, business development, marketing, right? I'm, I'm willing to do all these things to help engineering hire, to get contracts done, um, to do AR, PR, and IR. But I would say from, from a founding perspective, you know, work with people you know and trust because trust, be, trust will be challenged. And you got to know where these people stand. And, and we've all done life together. And then Anil Gunturu, he's another of our, our longtime friends from Starrant. He's just one of the warmest, brightest people we've ever met in addition to Tim. He works far too hard, uh, sacrifices life and limb. And um, But again, that's what I would say from a founder's perspective is know who you're going to battle with. Make sure you guys all have each other's back. Make sure that you know, you're know you willing to say, I'm awful at this and I'm good at this and, and uh, have those candid conversations. It's not all bunnies and apples and, and rose colored glasses. We have uh, once a month, we kind of have what we call the OSM meeting, which is O explicative meeting, right? 
So, or moments, uh, we have those set up once a month. Everybody knows what this meeting's for. You're going to come and you're going to, you're going to break glass and you're going to talk about things that are really hard internally or externally. But I would say from a founding perspective, um, know the people you're getting into, into business with, trust them and, uh, and, and just, you know, make sure everybody's complimentary to each other and, and honest. Now, one um, of the, one of the things, Kevin, that, um, struck me about your pathway your journey as a founding team is you you do have a, a hero customer and you mentioned it's in the satellite business and there's this really fine line to be walked by founders that you know are you building for this one particular customer or are you building capabilities that can serve a lot more and i've always respected how you guys have balanced that which is hey we want to make this customer happy we're we're, we're learning a lot in the process we're going to take those learnings and bake it into the capabilities of oasis works to serve more can you can you share how you guys balance that you know don't build something special for one person or one company rather but uh, learn from that and build capabilities for others yeah, when we started the company, we decided that we were going to do, you know, what we call blue collar technology work. And so for the first six months of our company, we did systems integration contract work. And basically, I went out there and found customers from my Rolodex and, and friends that needed a problem solved and they could spend 50 grand in three months. And Tim wrote the code. Um, so for, for many months, we were basically a job shop and we just put cash in the bank and knew that, you know, in some time frame, we were going to be able to switch from a, a services company to a product company. But you always want to switch sooner than you're ready or is ever imaginable. And it's been a, a crazy journey for us. And so we did a lot of services work. But when we were doing that services work, you know, we were out there asking the questions and that's how we ended up kind of with this slide here, which is, hey guys, you know, we're writing code for you to solve these little problems, but what's a big problem you're facing, right? And so we just gathered all this customer sentiment. And as we gathered all this customer sentiment, we saw a lot of common things coming up. And that's how we really drew you know, our through line, if you're a, you know, if you're a TED talk person, right, you have this through line that everything comes back to and you test it against every time. Now, the through line is not straight. It's jagged. Sometimes it looks like a sine curve, uh, but it is a path to get from where you are to where you want to go. And so um, it was incredibly hard doing services work, doing contract work. And then we uh, got in front of our satellite customer and they said, hey, uh, we really need something to help us manage, you know, these satellite gateways and these hub nodes. Would you guys be interested in, in, you know, adapting your software to fit our needs? And at that time, it was five of us. And, you know, we were now paying people's salaries and, you know, people's health care was now covered by Oasis Works, right? We pay 100% of everyone's health care for medical and dental because we felt that was super important. But now you've got a, a burn rate and now, you know, you're, you're getting into these deliverable based engagements and you have to deliver or, you know, people don't get paid. So uh, Scott Miley, one of our founders is always talking about clipping the treetops, right? Like we're, we're edging close to the treetops, you know, we've got to pull up or crash. And we've had a few of those moments and it's awful and it's scary when you're thinking about laying 15 people off before Christmas. Um, and, and not knowing where you're going to, you know, end up with your revenues. But what I would say is that you stay true to what you want to build and you stay true to what you should build and you very carefully question what you could build, right? Should and could are very similar words, but they're incredibly different when it comes to making decisions. Right. And so should we hire someone? Well, we could hire someone, but should we hire someone? Well, we could use this technology, but should we use that technology? Uh, we could go after this industry or segment, but should we? Um, and it's hard. You, you want to add more people. You want to add more customers. You want to have more products well before you're ever ready. And, you know, you get smacked in the face. And you just get back up and and this is where having your friends as founders and and other leaders is like, guys, we did this for a reason. Let's get back up. 
It's been an awful three weeks, but it will get better. It will get better. Um, and I'm wearing a hat that says no gophers on it. So no gophers is a, sen- is a saying we have in Oasis Works that means, hey, don't run around underneath the organization and create holes and channels that people can't see. But when you walk across, you're going to break an ankle and bad things are going to happen. So no gophers at Oasis Works. If you got a problem, don't be cute and cuddly and then just pop your head up and smile and then go and, and undermine the entire organization or development track or path. Bring that sucker to the top and we can talk about it and we'll get through it. But could versus should and restraint um, are some things that you have to stay you know, very, very focused on. And, and we were blessed to have a, a great satellite customer and partner. We've been blessed to have some other go to channel, go to market partners and customers. And you just, you have to keep looking at your operating plan. You have to keep looking at the potential. Um, you know, do you want to forward invest? I mean, nobody could have planned for COVID. Are you kidding? We, we basically got a brand new headquarters building in Boston. It opened up on the early part of January. It closed two weeks later, and then nobody went to it for almost six weeks. I mean, we're sitting there paying lease and rental fees on a beautiful new headquarters building, and nobody's going to it. Um, but, you know, we had to figure out how to do, you know, remote development and keep people on task and motivated. But we've also had to realize that our productivity is probably down about 20% because of COVID. Mm-hmm. You know, people got stuff going on at home and they used to come to the office to get away from the dog that always barks or or whatever your other responsibilities are. And so, you know, it's it's incredibly hard. It's fulfilling at times, but as long as you, you know, are restrained and you believe in what you're doing, uh, I would just say that everything takes longer than you would ever imagine. So if you think it's going to take me three months to break through that curve, it's probably going to take you eight months. Yeah. Um, and you have to be realistic about that. You got to be a, a cheerleader, but you got to be realistic and, and set it up for you know meaningful expectations. And then you got to celebrate a lot. We try to celebrate all the time. And, and we also say that we like to struggle well with kindness. Yeah, we're going to struggle, but don't be a prick about it. Like if you see somebody misbehaving and, and, you know, let's, let's have that conversation, no gopher say, Hey, you make some really great points, but your delivery is incredibly harsh. Um, and it's just a part of the culture we try to drive and man, we make mistakes all the time. And, and, you know, we, we end up getting smacked and saying, Hey, you are not struggling well with kindness. You are struggling awful with hatred. Uh, and, but as long as it's modeled well, um, it, it does well. And so it's, yeah, it's, uh, it has been an incredible journey, but I, I wouldn't sacrifice it for anything else. No doubt. Last question, Kevin, um, as you mentioned earlier, and there's been some folks who've actually approached me privately about getting your, your email. So you might see some follow-up from, from today, but, um, sure. You're at a point where you, you you all have built Oasis Works. You've been cash flow positive for a while. You've essentially self-funded a lot of this development, and now you have interest from the venture community. As a you know, as a co-founder at Oasis Works, how are you guys thinking about venture capital, and what what are some things that sort of on your mind? Because in many ways, it's not you know getting venture capital is a great a great way to demonstrate external value perception on what you've built, and that's fantastic and it's great and all. But in many ways, it's also, you know, you're dipping into another part of the, the the business going forward. So I'd love to get your just top line. What do you guys think about in that world? Yeah, we've we've danced with venture previous in our lives. Um, I'm just running a Linux install just so that you guys can see what the install workflow looks like in terms of somebody going and uh, installing Linux. Um, what I would say is that the 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 venture world is. I'm going to reset this because for some reason it's, there we go. Uh, I wasn't talking to the server. Uh, Venture is good. We don't have any issues with venture. Uh, You know, there's pros and cons to taking venture and, and uh, you just have to seriously look at it. Just remember that venture person is going to ask you hard questions and you got to be prepared for hard questions. They're not personal, but they're hard, right? They, and they're good. They're really good. And you just have to realize, are you ready for those questions? Do you have those answers? Can you back those answers up with delivery or fact? Um, 
And then it's a personality thing. You know, some people, uh, you know, venture folks are, are different personalities, just like, you know, me and, and Jim are different personalities, similar, but different. You just have to ask your questions. Is this, you know, your question, is this the right time for this investment with this maybe dilution? Uh, and then weigh that against the opportunity. You know, how is this venture going to take me into a place I couldn't get? They're going to introduce me to customers or partners. Are they going to validate us as a company to the world? Um, can we spend their money well or not well? Hopefully not. Um, but venture is good, but it has to be weighed just like customers do. I mean, we could have gone and got a, a really giant customer uh, early in our in our life in addition to our satellite customer, but it would have sank the boat. And so, yeah, we could go get venture, but should we go get venture? Yeah, we could go get another big customer, but should we? Um, the last thing we want to do is is under deliver. And so we've been very restrained in terms of our spending, our venture raises and our customer onboarding and, and uh, acquisition. But in 2021, the build once, sell many part of our life cycle is going to come to fruition. And it's part of that conversion from you know, services to product. And in the back half of 2021, we'll be offering some IoT options as well, in addition to our IaaS and PaaS options. And it'll cross whether it's retail or edge service provider or enterprise or oil and gas. But um, we like venture. We don't have any problems with venture, but you got to pick the right time. Um, you got to pick the right venture partner you got to understand that it's it's just like having a customer. They ask really hard questions, but they're there to ask hard questions. They're there to make you better. And, uh, you know, it's like speed dating, right? You're going to go see a bunch of venture and in a five or 10 or 15 minute engagement, you're going to have to suss out whether or not you want to take it to the next level and give them another pitch or move on. Uh, and then then you go on the first date and you got to realize, do you want to have kids with this person? Do you want to get married? Do you want to buy a house? I mean, it's it's a relationship, right? That's what mm -hmm. everything is. And venture is just like that. It's a relationship. So work hard at the relationship um, and, and, and treat it as a relationship, ups and downs for sure. One thing that I've always been impressed about, uh, Kevin, is that you and the team have, you know, taking the long game, long game view of building Oasis Works and its opportunity and so often in this industry of you know building new technology and trying to break into new markets, you know burn rates and other things put pressure on on us all to kind of have to play the short game too, right? And there's that balance, and you've you've all done a great job of of you know balancing your perspectives and the short term with the could we should we and then the long term as well. It's a great model that you shared. Thank you. Uh, it's well, hard. This, yeah. No. Hey. Yeah. Sorry. Th this isn't for but everybody. It's fun. That's for certain. Yeah. yeah. And what you guys have built is really fun as well. What I was hoping to accomplish today, I think we nailed it, is that you all you you showed us some new capabilities that really makes more sense of the edge that Oasis Works is pursuing, and and really ultimately easy. And that's fantastic. We've had a few folks reach out saying, "Hey, they'd like to get some time to learn more about it." But uh, with that, Kevin, thank you so much for your time today and talking us through um, both the product journey with Oasis Works and uh, founder to founder perspective as well. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. And like I said, if, uh, if everybody wants to reach out either directly or indirectly, please let us know. You'll see us a lot more active in the 5G Open Innovation Lab. And um, we're glad to be here. It's a, an incredible opportunity to actually evolve and drive the industry. So thanks for having us. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining in. And again, thank you, Kevin. Have a good rest of your day and have a good rest of your day, guys, and great weekend as well. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Take care. See ya.